recent review, our guest today was described as having rock bottom musical and emotional integrity. Having held down the coveted Friday night slot at Small's Jazz Club in New York City for years, he now resides in Charlottesville. Join us today as we catch up with educator and tenor saxophonist Charles Owens. Come on. Charles, how old were you when you started playing music? I don't remember how old I was. I think that I was sitting at the piano from the time that I was in diapers. I mean, uh, you have pictures. I, remember, I have pictures, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember very distinctly sitting at the piano when I was really, really small and just being fascinated by the way two notes or three notes or four notes sound at the same time by the chords. And my parents are great in that sense of they just let me sit and play and you just, <laughs> just wow. Did. And then yeah. how old were you when you fell in love with saxophone, when you chose, and, and why did you choose the saxophone? Well, uh, I was eight, and there was an assembly at my elementary school. And they had one every year, and the band teacher would line up all the instruments on the table. And uh, he picked up the tenor sax. And I think at first I was struck by how many buttons there were on it and like how complicated it looked and how complex and mysterious it looked. And then also the thing that really got me was the curve of the neck, this curvature of this neck right here. The way it curved around was just very attractive to me. And I wanted to be closer to the instrument and just like really see how it worked. rough childhood. Tell us about, you know, kind of what music meant to you through all of that. Yeah, I did have a bit of a rough childhood. Uh, and one of the things that really got me into interested in music is that my father and mother weren't really. And I wanted you to, wanted to go <laughs> far, far, <laughs> as far as you could. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I was fascinated by it, especially with the saxophone. It gave me a way to, uh, a healthy way to release my anger, emotions, my pain, uh, yeah, something about breathing into the horn. Was yeah, very... you were saying in an earlier conversation how that breathing is another reason that you love the saxophone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real connection to the instrument. Um, it's a real physical connection. I love playing piano uh, because piano is very sophisticated and, and uh, it's, it's civil, you know? You're not, your head isn't vibrating and there's not spit going everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not like heavy, heavy breathing. You're just sort of like, hmm, let me have a sandwich and then eat, play some piano. And, <laughs> You know, like, yeah. it's different. It's totally different than saxophone. But with saxophone, it, it, it's, it lends itself to an emotional release. Mm -hmm. Because like crying or yelling, uh, you breathe and you, you exhale and you just let it all go. With saxophone, it's very similar. And also, the saxophone players that I like, like John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins and Wayne Shorter and those guys are all very emotional players. And uh, the saxophone just really lends itself to that. And it's helped me deal with a lot of things. It continues to help me deal with a lot of I, things. Yeah, I think that's great. <laughs> I went to Duke Ellington School for the Arts in Washington, D.C., uh, near Georgetown, near Georgetown University. Uh -huh. And I also went to New World School of the Arts in Miami, set in downtown Miami. And then I went to the New School for Social Research, mm. world-renowned jazz program, studied with a lot of great masters there. Yeah, and then you played in New York City. You lived and played in New York City for years. You had a coveted spot every Friday at Smalls, at Smalls. which is a renowned jazz yes. club. What was 20 years now. that like? <laughs> My first gig in New York was at the Village Gate. Oh! Huh. <laughs> which was, you know, ex it was a boon for me. Right. You know, uh, there was right. a Sunday afternoon jam session at the Village Gate, and that's where I met everybody. Yeah. And then the Village Gate unfortunately closed, so that Sunday session moved to Smalls, and that was my first gig at Smalls, the Sunday jam session that was run by the new school. And that became my home. Uh, literally. <laughs> yes. You literally. lived there for a while. I did. I, I uh, 
slept in a very small room that was big enough for a futon and a radio. And my only responsibilities were to play saxophone and to work at the door at Smalls to help pay my rent to, from living there. And then wow. to write music and that wow. was it. <laughs> and now, okay, so now you and your now wife and your two beautiful daughters yes. live here in this area. Mm -hmm. In Charlottesville. And you tour, you play Charlottesville, Richmond, D.C., New York. Mm -hmm. I still go to um, Smalls uh, three or four times a year to play. And, and how goodness. many albums do you have now? Five albums. And I just recorded a new one yesterday. We did ten songs in five hours, which is, seems crazy. Yeah, a little. <laughs> uh huh. But I like to record that way. The way I do it is I get a new band, and I pick repertoire, and then I get gigs. And we go and perform these, rep these gigs, uh, this repertoire at these gigs. And then after a year or so, it's been a year and a half since I've had this quartet, we go in and we play them all right in succession as if we were just playing another gig. <laughs> Other most recent album, A Day With Us, has mm -hmm. gotten all kinds of fabulous reviews. That's done That was very recorded well. in the same way. It was recorded actually at Jellostone Studios that was built by Devon Harris, who is the drummer. Right? Yeah. yeah. He was the drummer on the record, but he's also a great piano player and a great bass player and a great producer. He built the studio. He recorded yeah. it. Um, a Day With Us was an amazing experience because we did also do that in one day, but there was no one at the studio. It was just us three. Devon would literally go to this control room, hit record, come back, get on the drums, and then we'd count it off and then do a take. So it was a special record, and, and the critics really did like it, and yeah. uh, I'm very proud of it. The other thing I think you should be really proud of is the fact that you're such a great educator in the community. Thank you. And you work with, you have a lot of private students, you teach saxophone theory is a big one, you mm -hmm. teach voice, you piano, mm -hmm. and you work with high schools you work with, Albemarle High School, yep. jazz kids. What is your best piece of advice that you like to give your students? The thing that has served me best in my life is my ear and my instinct. The saxophone being such a new instrument, it's not included in any of the classical repertoire. So saxophone repertoire and saxophone as an instrument have to be approached differently when, from an educational standpoint. You right. know, your ear and your instinct is not going to be 100%, but it, if you nurture it and nurture the connection between your instinct and your ear and learn to trust it, yeah. then it will never let you down after a certain point. Yeah. Okay, so show us, you play a lot of jazz, mm -hmm. funk, yes. rock. Some, yes. Mm -hmm. um, give us an example. Play, just play a little something. Play, oh. play some jazz. Some jazz? As you like to say, jazz. Sure. And do a little of that improvising that you were talking about. Of course. Of course, we have no band, but <laughs> you don't need a band. Okay, so you have a philosophy about music yes. that you tell people. Tell me, I want you to show me that and tell okay. me what that means. Sure. Music is melody, harmony, and rhythm. When we play music, we have to be calm. And w what we play has to be clear. And we have to play it with confidence. Just how we're speaking to each other. We're being so clear and eloquent, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> uh, and so, and that's important. We have to. We have ideas that we want to get across. I mean, the reason I'm an artist, the reason I'm a musician, is I want to make my fellow humans feel something that they weren't expecting to feel. You know, so we have to be clear about it. If we're standing up in front of a big crowd of people, or even just by ourselves, or even one or two people in the audience, think if Martin Luther King was like, "I have a dream, you guys." <laughs> he, would, he says, I have a dream, very so we have to be really confident, okay. you know. So we're calm, we're playing clearly, we're playing confidently, we have melody, harmony, and rhythm mixed. From where do we gain our inspiration to play this music? We gain it from our spirituality, our intellect, and our passion. And that's really one of the things that will make the audience feel. If you really believe what you're doing, then they will believe it. They will love it. And then when we do that, we have to take stock all the time. Every t as much as whenever we're playing, we have to take stock of all these things together. 
And it's no accident that these three, three things are grouped together. Confidence, rhythm, passion, clear, clarity, harmony, intellect, calm, melody, spiritual. They definitely go together. But really, in order for it to go right, it has to be all mixed up. Yeah. And you have one, the artist has to ask themselves, am I, is this a, a balanced mix of all these things? And if it is, then your audience will have no choice but to love you. So tell me about the experience that you had when you were asked to perform A Love Supreme, Coltrane's... Uh, opus. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a Love Supreme was Coltrane's greatest work, in many people's opinion. It's mm -hmm. been one of the greatest albums of all time ever recorded, mm -hmm. and it's a very spiritual work. I never dreamed that I would be able to perform it, not because I didn't think that I'd ever be able to do it, but just I never thought that I'd have a chance to do it. But this was real. This was... Uh, it was one of the best moments in my life. It really, really was. It wasn't just one of the, oh, that was a great moment, you know? Like, uh, it was a moment that transcended my reality a little bit, and uh, it made me sort of peek behind the curtain, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's moments in every jazz musician's life, and the reason why people get addicted to playing jazz and they devote their entire life to it is because uh, I, I like to talk about like peeking behind the curtain of reality and seeing something greater, you know? Uh, and that's that's why I play uh, because I want to be something greater than I am, you know. <laughs> 